आदाब सतकर्ता और वाहू जी का खालसा वाहू जी की फतेह नमस्कार वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू एवरी वन हेयर इन इंडिया एंड ए वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू दोज इन इंगल तेरा एंड पोलैंड सो वी हैव अ वेरी डियर फ्रेंड हुज एक्चुअली ऑनलाइन विद मी बट वी आर टुडे वी गोन बी शोइंग यूर रिकॉर्डिंग दैट वी डिड ऑन ऑन ट्यूजडे um on july or oh, this is july Ju- june 29th would it be um so we had planned to go live on saturday but the system that we were trying to uh live stream with was supposed to uh help us bring in a stereo uh, record uh, you know audio signal of the piano which would have been exciting to hear uh but somehow with the software and the systems that i use uh and the uh, symptonic uh, which which our friends are developing in italy and and uh, elsewhere in europe um it was it was not possible somehow to to bring the audio so then we worked quite a bit and then in the end we had to settle down on planning to record meantime cheslav had flown from london to uh poland and uh, and then we decided that we just record so we placed two microphones uh stereo matched pair on on the piano and which uh, leonardo amartyan singh my younger son has um you know worked on that uh, on the audio and i edited the film in the last 4 days it was quite a complex because it was a, because we knew it was recording so we were a little liberal with our conversation <laughs> chat and these there were technical snags so i've had to uh, work quite a bit um i've edited it it's about an hour and 41 minute conversation um and cheslav is um um will i i you know at the end of the um uh, uh, session today or towards after after the recording rather if i may rephrase uh, we'll have cheslav also join in and if there are any queries or conversation um that you would like to have with him uh, we will um sort of coax him into that um i mean he's an agreement he he's around he's cooking right now as i finished washing utensils so we are also running our lockdown or near lockdown or self imposed lockdown chores um this uh is an interesting conversation uh an important one for youngsters for budding artists uh who uh will learn how to look at heritage uh assets intangible assets how to interpret them how to attend to them uh, that i think is very very important anyway here is the recording from um june 29th 2021 that uh, i hosted with uh, um of the session that i hosted with cheslav bala singh uh, who joined me from poznan poland here we go and i'll see you on the other side of the recording
bravo. That was <laughs> fantastic. You know, um, it's kind of not ready yet, but it's, it's in this really nice phase where I'm trying to just um, find my find a, a way to play it, you know, and I'm kind of involved in it still. And so, so I make mistakes <laughs> and I guess I, but I don't feel, I don't feel ashamed of it. You know, um, Andras Schiff said once that, uh, you know, there's too many people play these last three Beethoven sonatas, you know, all these young pianists, they come and you shouldn't play it until, until you're old enough. He said something like that. And so I have really mixed feelings about that because that means when I play badly, I'm still young. And then if I play it well, that means I'm old. And I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. If you're old enough then. <laughs> so, you know, I'm kind of, I'm okay with that. And, yeah. and you know, there was some, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to experiment a little bit and searching for, for timbres and things like that. And sometimes I, I distract myself, you know, and, uh, but that's, that's part of the process, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad. Um, uh, let me, uh, now welcome everybody. Um, Satkardar, Dosto, Varjika Khalsa, Varjika Fateh, Namaskar, Adab, a very good evening, um, um, to everyone. Um, um, this is we we are trying a new experiment we are recording this so when you hear it uh, it would have been recorded and post produced uh, to some extent uh, i welcome you all in fact it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 205th yarnad virtual badek series mela um, this is a season 2 episode 44 and i have been listening and enjoying the piano played by uh, composer and pianist Czeslav Balasing, uh, who is joining me live from Poznan and uh, Poland. Um, Czeslav Balasing is a Canadian-born pianist and composer, of course, now based in London, but he has a wonderful, wonderful home in Poznan. Um, he studied piano under renowned musicians uh, such as Dr. Sophie Moshevic, uh, Regina Bodnaya, Raymond Sp uh, Spasovsky, um, Jeanette uh, Fujarjuk, um, Bogomil Noviki, Noviki, and Dr. Zizhe Striniak. Uh, as a soloist, he performed in prestigious venues in the USA, Canada, and Europe. He's also a studio artist and an educator. His compositional style ranges from small ensembles to symphony orchestras. In 2015, he co-founded Our Place Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to disseminating art in all its forms, effectively and extensively to audiences, as well as encouraging cultural exchanges. Uh, based out of Poland, it has pursued a steady course of inviting artists to Poland and sending Polish artists abroad. Among its most recent achievements are the curation and production of an international audiovisual festival uh, Sviatozviki, uh, messing up the name, we'll have Cheslev pronounce it correct for us later, um, which had uh, its fourth edition in 2019, and the composition and production of an interdisciplinary show dedicated to the victims of the first Nazi uh, concentration camp on occupied Polish territory. Hailing from a Sikh background, Cheslev uh, delved his Interest in Kurbani Sangeet tradition, studying with its primary exponent, the one and only Bible Deep Singh. So, uh, welcome, uh, Chastlav, uh, uh, to to the uh, to the conversation, and a brief uh, introduction in Punjabi as well. Dosto mere jani dushmano te pyar te nafrat pareyo, ji ayanu. Uh, those are those are recording uh, or uh, uh, Bala Singh 
ਮੇਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜ ਚੁੱਕੇ ਨੇ ਪੋਜ਼ਨਨ ਪੋਲੈਂਡ ਚੋ ਇਹ ਲੰਡਨ ਤੋਂ ਆਏ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਕੁਝ ਦਿਨਾਂ ਲਈ ਔਰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਬੜੀ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਕੁਝ ਗੁਫਤਗੂ ਕਰ ਸਕਾਂਗੇ ਇਹ ਪਿਆਨਿਸਟ ਹਨਗੇ ਕੰਪੋਜ਼ਰ ਹਨਗੇ ਹਾਲ ਤੱਕ ਹਾਲ ਦੇ ਦਿਨਾਂ ਤੱਕ ਇਹ ਪੋਲੈਂਡ ਹੀ ਵਸਦੇ ਸਨ ਪਰ ਹੁਣੇ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਾਨੀਆ ਸ਼ਿਫਟ ਕਰ ਗਏ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਪਿਆਨੋ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਬੜੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਦਿਗਜ ਨਾਮਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਜੀ ਐਸ ਟਰਿਨਿਆਕ ਔਰ ਇਹ ਬੜੀਆਂ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਥਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਨਸਰਟ ਸਪੇਸਸ ਨੇ ਅਮਰੀਕਾ ਚ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਚ ਤੇ ਯੂਰਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਜਾ ਚੁੱਕੇ ਨੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਇਹ ਸੋਲੋ ਆਪਣੇ ਸਟੂਡੀਓ ਆਰਟਿਸਟ ਵੀ ਹਨਗੇ ਔਰ ਇੱਕ ਐਜੂਕੇਟਰ ਵੀ ਹਨਗੇ ਤਾਲੀਮ ਵੀ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕੰਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਾਈਲ ਰੇਂਜ ਹੈਗੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਛੋਟੇ ਐਨਸੈਂਬਲ ਤੋਂ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਸਿੰਫਨੀ ਆਰਕੈਸਟਰਾ ਤੱਕ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਇਹ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਦਾ ਦਖਲ ਹੈ 2015 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਆ ਪਲੇਸ ਫਾਊਂਡੇਸ਼ਨ ਇੱਕ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕੀਤੀ ਸੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਿੱਤਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਿ ਵਿਦਿਆ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਕਰ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਕਲਚਰਲ ਐਕਸਚੇਂਜ ਕਰ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਪੋਲੈਂਡ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬਾਹਰਲੇ ਆਰਟਿਸਟਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੁਲਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਪੋਲੈਂਡ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਪੋਲਿਸ਼ ਆਰਟਿਸਟ ਨੂੰ ਭੇਜਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬੜਾ ਵੱਡਾ ਫੈਸਟੀਵਲ ਸੀਗਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਆਡੀਓ ਵਿਜ਼ੂਅਲ ਫੈਸਟੀਵਲ ਉਹ ਕਿਊਰੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀਗਾ 2019 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਔਰ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੰਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਡਕਸ਼ਨ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਬੜਾ ਇੰਟਰਡਿਸਪਲਿਨਰੀ ਸੀ ਔਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੂਜੇ ਤੇ ਪਹਿਲੇ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਯੁੱਧਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਾਜ਼ੀ ਕਨਸੈਂਟ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਕੈਂਪ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਦੂਜੇ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਯੁੱਧ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਨ ਪੋਲੈਂਡ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆਕਿਊਪਾਈ ਟੈਰੀਟਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਜਰਮਨੀ ਨੇ ਕਬਜ਼ਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੋਇਆ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵਿਕਟਿਮ ਸਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਡੈਡੀਕੇਟਡ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਗੁਰਸਿੱਖ ਪਛੋਕੜ ਹੈ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਪਿਤਾ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਆਰਥ ਸਰਦੇਵ ਸਿੰਘ ਸਨ ਹਾਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਡੇਢ ਸਾਲ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਉਹ ਫੌਤ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਔਰ ਗੁਰਬਾਣੀ ਸੰਗੀਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਖਾਸ ਸ਼ੌਕ ਹੈ ਔਰ ਦਾਸ ਦੇ ਕੋਲੋਂ ਇਹ ਤਾਲੀਮ ਕਈ ਕਾਫੀ ਵਰਿਆਂ ਤੋਂ ਵੀ ਲੈ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਆਓ ਆਪਾਂ ਗੁਫਤਗੂ ਦਾ ਦੌਰ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰੀਏ ਚੈਸਲ ਬਾਲਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਹੋਣਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮੇਰਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮਾਈ ਇੰਟਰਸਟ ਟੁਡੇ ਵਿਦ ਚੈਸਲ ਹੈਸ ਬੀਨ ਇਨ ਇਨ ਟਰਮਸ ਆਫ ਇਨ ਫੈਕਟ ਆਈ ਵਾਸ ਇਨ ਕਨਵਰਸੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਿਦ ਹਿਮ ਐਂਡ ਇਨ ਇਨ ਐਂਡ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਂਗ ਟੂ ਸੀ ਵਾਟ ਵੀ ਕੁਡ ਡਿਸਕਸ ਟੁਡੇ ਮਾਈ ਪਰਟੀਕੂਲਰ ਇੰਟਰਸਟ ਹੈਸ ਬੀਨ ਇਨ ਇਸ ਇਨ ਦ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਹੀ ਇਜ਼ ਇਨ ਹੀ ਇਜ਼ ਪ੍ਰਪੇਅਰਿੰਗ ਫੋਰ ਅ ਮੇਜਰ ਕਨਸਰਟ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਵਾਸ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿਡ ਇਨ ਸੀਇੰਗ ਹਾਊ ਇਜ਼ ਹੀ ਪ੍ਰਪੇਅਰਿੰਗ ਵਿਦ ਦ ਮੈਥੋਡੋਲੋਜੀ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਪੈਡਾਗੋਜੀ ਰਿਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਦੈਟ ਹੀ ਡਸ how does he dedicate himself to uh, the idea of betterwen and in how I mean, how does he make a choice of you know what he's to play uh, is it something that he is very comfortable with or does he um, he's like an explorer uh, who chooses a new frontier is like is he exploring betterwen uh, something that has been there on the shelf but he wants to wake him up in a way that he is not woken uh, betterwen up again from sleep so that was my interest and he was very kind to uh you know to to sort of uh, allow me in that uh in that sacred space when you know any any serious and dedicated and a responsible artist in particular uh would be very very uh sort of private uh in dedicating oneself uh for for uh um for a concept that uh, uh that 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 my so that protagonist is working on so i'm very excited to to begin this uh conversation with him cheslav over to you how are you and this was amazing what you played i enjoyed it i know that you said that oh you know sometimes it can be mistakes and all that well i'm a certified illiterate in music so i wouldn't have known a note from another uh i enjoyed it and tell us tell us about what you did and what are you up to well um so i mean i i thank you for the sentiment but the concert isn't so major that i'm preparing
if you want to, if anybody wants to come. It's a free event, so part of the festival, um, and and it's very exciting. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to play these sonatas that I've been working on them for a little while, which maybe wasn't so self-evident from how I played it, <laughs> but. Um, you know, the, 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 the mood is a little bit like today that uh, we were just speaking that uh, I was filming a little earlier, which is always tiring and and um, I've been up here in this attic for a little while where it's very hot, which is also tiring. <laughs> and so, so my mood is a little bit, uh, it's not such a, I'm not feeling so precise right now, but and of course, a bit if, I may, if I may add there that because it's hot, the piano has been playing itself. I mean, he has had to tune it over and over again. So I know it's, it's a, we are in the middle of a casino rather. <laughs> to borrow that's right. the Neapolitan phrase, yeah. <laughs> which, which isn't a bad thing at all. And um, it's just, just the way it is. And so my mood is kind of like, uh, I'm feeling a little bit like exploring today. Um, generally, I think I'm in that mood, which maybe I'm cutting it a little bit too short to the recital. But uh, thankfully, when I return to London, I'll have enough time to to sit and work seriously on these with with the metronome. And memory isn't a problem. I've I've known them for a little while, so mm. I mean, there's there's so much to say really about these three pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rightfully they've been called like a triptych. You know, so they're, they're really meant to be played together. And they were written in about a period of two years, uh, from about uh, 1820 to 1822. So Beethoven was uh, about, when he finished, he was about five years before death. He died in 1827. And um, uh, he was completely deaf, of course. Mm -hmm. Couldn't hear a thing. So that's something always to remember, I think, when we play these pieces is that he had no oral experience of these pieces. He didn't actually, he never felt what they sounded like. He could hear it in his head, uh, but he never had the experience of hearing it from the outside. And that leads us to all kinds of interesting things. So, I mean, for example, if we, if we look at these three sonatas together as one piece, if we ignore, I played the second movement of the Opus 111, which is the last sonata, it's the 32nd Beethoven sonata. And if we listen to the theme of it, uh, uh, yeah, that's kind of a derivation of the theme. We see that it's kind of based on a fourth and a fifth, which is in these three sonatas, the widest we get. Because if you look at uh, Opus 109, so the 30th sonata, the first, the second movement is all built around third. So you have this. So we have thirds. And another. And another. And another. And another. So there's thirds everywhere in that fragment. Then when we get to the second movement, same thing. Third. And even if we look at the, the right hand, falls a third, goes up a fifth, falls a third, goes up a sixth. But, but the main theme uh, in the second movement, of course, is in the left hand. And so we have a, it's a minor third. Third movement, it's all based on thirds. There's a third. So the, the, really the driving interval of these, the Opus 109 is a third. Then when we get to the Opus 110, the 31st sonata, it's an A-flat major, and we have... So we have it, it starts at a third, but it goes up a fourth, and another fourth. movement in the in the in, maybe not so much in the second movement though in the uh, trio uh, there's a great uh, motive
interval it's built on. We're sure that it starts on a very dramatic uh, a sixth. Yeah, and then we have that uh, kind of a contrapuntal theme later, which seems to want to be built on a uh, tritone or something like that, but it's mm. actually just a third. And then in the last movement, the one that I just played, uh, entirely starts on a fourth, goes to a fifth. So the melodic intervals, it's shifting between four and five, but then right at the end where we have those trills, becomes a fifth mm. and you know through the it kind of leans into a fifth and and that kind of shows us that the, the fifth is really the winner isn't it wow. so over these is we have this expansion from a third to a fourth to a fifth and um now maybe that's not exactly what it's about but you know there's this there's this way that uh, one of the, part of the process, oh, you're speaking of the process a little earlier. Um, part of the process really is coming up with stories. And so I can come up with a very convincing story, let's say, uh, about a, a piece or a fragment of a piece. And, and I can use it then to communicate something. So for example, from the first movement of this last Sonata, I like to think about this very kind of troublesome part as, uh, you know, the old Beethoven frustrated with one of his new ideas. He doesn't know how to write it, if it should be flipped upside down or if it should be extended or if it should be, you know, diminished or what he should do with it. And he's walking around in his favorite forests and, and bellowing like he always used to do, you know, he couldn't hear himself, so he made sure everybody else did. And he had his notebook and he was scribbling and he's kind of fran frantically going around and searching for these ideas. And then all of a sudden he has this moment where he stops and he looks, you know, at something around him and he says, oh, what a nice flower there is or what a nice tree or this leaf or this light is looking very pretty today. And he takes a moment to take that in and then very dr dramatically kind of gets back into the into the, uh, the uh, you know, being frantic about everything. And so, for, so 
this is the place I like to think about that. So we have Beethoven walking around being frantic. <laughs> So that's a story that I made up, let's say. Oh, I, I don't even know if I made it up. I might have read it somewhere. Um, but it's somewhere in my, in my mind. And I think that's a very uh, kind of appropriate way of looking at that fragment. Um, but I think a lot of people then make the mistake in believing that that's really what the fragment means. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't go there. I would say that that's um, a, a, a narrative that helps me understand what to communicate about that music mm. you know, closer to the proportions or to the idea that the music has behind it whether the details are in agreement you know with what it really means i don't think it's so important at this point because it's not really about my images it's it's about the relationship between those images so that contrast of the frantic beethoven walking around and then stopping and appreciating the flower the difference is what's important between those two sections, not necessarily that it's Beethoven and then that it's a flower or a tree or a light or something like that. And so um, that's one of the things that I think are uh, important in, in, in the process that I have when, when uh, you know, dealing with pieces. And it's something I try to instill in, in my students as well, this idea of coming up with narratives, thinking about it, taking the time and saying, what is this actually about you know um does that make any sense yeah yeah absolutely and um the other thing that interests me is um is the idea of i mean interpretation is very important in a way you're you're building a narrative that also of course breaks monotony that means everybody who's playing it and if they're trying to interpret do katha of that uh, would would bring in colors you know uh, which which uh, and perhaps a collection amalgam of all of those interpretations is perhaps better when uh, together there um, but then the idea of um, uh, when you speak about that there are two ways of how you interpret or one is a technical one and and the other one you speak um, that of in intention. Uh, can you please explain that? Absolutely. Well, that's a that's a very good very good question. Very interesting one. So you know, uh, we we can we can look at the simplest possible ways of of thinking about these things. So of course, when we talk about technical aspects of the music, it would be a little bit about kind of what I was speaking about. So going from thirds to fourths to fifths. You know, that's, that's looking at the structure, for example, of the piece. It starts at places more basic than that, like first when you open a score. For example, I know that a lot of pianists, um, or musicians generally, they like to listen to the music that they're going to learn a lot, so that it kind of goes into their ear, um, listening to other interpretations of it. And then it becomes a little bit easier to remember the piece. 
I don't really like to do that so much because I find that it then it kind of limits my view on the piece. You know, the, the first way that I heard a piece played is the way that I tend to prefer it afterwards. And I think that's kind of a, a, a universal thing. It's hard to break out of that then. So when I'm learning a new piece, I tend to like just to spend time with the, with the notation, with the score. Mm. And even away from the instrument, uh, that's, that's one of the advantages of one of my teachers that you mentioned was uh, Jeanette Friarchuk. And she was a student of Alberto Guerrero, who was, of course, his most famous student was Glenn Gould, but, but he taught a lot of uh, fantastic Canadian pianists of, of that generation. Uh, and um, one of the important things that I got out of that school was uh, being able to learn music by memory just by looking at it, so away from the instrument. Right. Um, it's a very exercise of, to practice your memory. Um, and I mean, it, it's not an invention of Alberto Guerrero. We have stories about, uh, you know, Liszt learning a piece, uh, you know, by memory on the way uh, to a concert in the train there, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then without practicing it, just sitting down and playing it together with the orchestra. Uh, Rubinstein it did that. He noted a, a, a time when he did it, uh, I think it was the César Franck uh, symphonic variations for orchestra and piano, and he was on the train and he was working out the fingerings on his uh, knee, you know, and he went to the concert and played it from memory. Uh, so these are the things, I mean, I've never been that courageous, and I wouldn't be, I think, because I'm, I'm not there yet, let's say, but... Um, the the idea of learning things by memory just by looking at them it allows you that space of not getting tinged with other people's interpretations and then when you have an idea that's rather clear about the piece well then of course listen to everybody you can because usually there are people out there with better ideas than yourself <laughs> at least in some parts and uh, it's never a bad thing to learn from them so uh, that, that, that's, um, I would say, a part of it. Of course, deciphering rhythms, fingerings, like Rubinstein did. The piano uses all of our fingers uh, and in all of their p potential combinations. So there's a lot of sometimes work on that. I always remember this story. It's about Glenn Gould. When he, was, when he approached the Goldberg Variations for the second time in 1981, uh, he spent 72 hours just fingering the Goldberg variations. And wow. so if, if somebody like Glenn Gould, who is like a total genius, spent 72 hours fingering, how much time do I have to spend on fingering? You know, yeah. <laughs> I have to spend my whole life fingering. <laughs> so, yeah, what I mean is that it's, it's a serious problem, fingering yeah. sometimes, and it can... Uh, easy, it can make things very difficult if it's not done properly. Um, so when, when thinking about the technical side to learning a piece, those are the kinds of things I, I, I generally have in mind. Uh, when we get to the intention, we get to the why. So it's like, well, why did Beethoven go from a third to a fourth to a fifth? Right. What is it? Is the fifth better than the third or is it just wider or or what does that relationship mean uh in these particular contexts so we're asking the why why was it like this why was it written like this and you know in beethoven's time uh, there were two kinds of pianos ones that started from this c and ended on this c so it's six octaves i think let me count one two three four five six yeah six octave piano from C to C, and or a six octave piano from F to F. Uh, so as you see, it was a little bit shorter than our piano that we have now, just by a few keys. Uh, in Chopin's time, it got a little bit wider, and then eventually right. it formed here. Um, now this piece, this last sonata, for example, Opus 111, was clearly written uh, for a piano from C to C. 
because and it touches the highest and the lowest notes respectively uh, right. in different moments. Um, but there's one moment where Beethoven actually wrote a note outside of the range of a piano from C to C. I see. So he was he was anticipating that the piano was going to be wider. Um, it's it's in the uh, recapitulation where it goes. Uh, this right. is an E flat, third above the C, didn't exist on his piano, um, at least on the piano that he wrote this for. Um, so we look at that and we say, well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, it's not, not entirely strange. Of course, there were precedents. Bach used to do that all the time. Bach used to write impossible music. Uh, and then, uh, and the reason he was writing it was because um, the structure demanded it. So that's a similar situation here, uh, because in the exposition, we, it goes. So in the recapitulation, it has to go. And so it's a, it's a question of range there. Right. Um, uh, but that's super interesting. And in fact, if you look at the manuscripts and the first editions, uh, Beethoven gave a, uh, what we call, um, an alternative uh, that fit a piano with only six octaves from C to C. He gave the alternative of holding the C and playing like that. I'm exaggerating the break, but instead of playing, it was. So he offered that as an alternate version to this movement. Uh, in one of the first editions, in, in a correction to his, uh, right. for, for his edition. Um, so these are the little uh, bits and pieces that we get from the technical side of looking at a piece. So you're talking about where was Beethoven? What else was he writing? That's sometimes a very potent piece of uh, knowledge. Uh, for example, at the time he was writing these sonatas, he was also writing, at least for a part of the time, his big mass in D major. I see. Uh, and there's a kind of a fugetta in the 30th sonata that basically uses a theme from his mass, from the credo of his mass in particular. The credo is the part of the mass where one, uh, uh, how do we say? announces their faith or confirms their faith okay. and it's it's this it's this theme <laughs> the credo of the mass and it's it, it's not exactly one to one the left hand's doing something a little bit different but uh, it's 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 clear he had that in mind so that might give us a clue as to how to play that piece mm. that variation right we can say well if he took it from his credo maybe he wanted this fugue to be reverential or serious or something like that you know i i, I don't really know what it means, but uh, it could mean a number of things. And, and uh, uh, the point is then the decisions that you make on, let's say, how fast to play it is, um, it comes from that kind of a space. Because, yeah, well, the tempo, I mean, as a whole, is a whole other problem, isn't it? Mm. The, the pace at which you play a piece. Uh, there's a lot of um, fighting going on right now in the musicological world uh, in terms of what European classical music, particularly in this, in the authentic instruments movement or area. It's not a movement. It's, it's of course, a standalone area. Um, and the idea basically is that we play everything 
too fast. Mm. Let the way be metronome markings because uh, the metronome was invented about in the middle of Beethoven's life and Beethoven loved it. So as soon as he got one, uh, he marked all of his pieces with precise metronome markings. I see. This, yeah, this, this speed for this note and this and that. But the trouble is that now some scholarship has, I think, at least called to doubt that Beethoven didn't read the metronome the same way we do now. Oh. Um, <laughs> because, because before the metronome, tempo was measured with a pendulum. So you had, you, you had a pendulum on a string, basically, and you let it go and it would swing. Uh -huh. And the tempo was measured at that time, and this is a fact, this isn't under dispute, with one entire rotation. So, um, it, it, and, and of course, now we read the metronome as if the beat is at the bottom point. So we read it like this, like uh, mm -hmm. one beat, second beat, a third beat, fourth beat. Yeah. Uh, but in the old way, they used to measure it one and then two. Right. And, and so they, 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 there's a whole group of very serious scholars that think that uh, at Beethoven's time, the, the metronome markings were still being read in the old way. So, so the, even when they were using the metronome, it was the metronome was basically beating a half beat, mm. and understood it. And so, there's a big fight about tempo. And um, <laughs> so, even though we have Beethoven's very precise metronome markings, we don't really know exactly what to do with them because, I see. to be honest, many of them are too fast. And I don't just mean for piano; I mean for uh, orchestras. Right? If we if we play uh, his symphonies at the metronome markings that he gave, they're almost unplayable. They're just too quick. And uh, the same is true for Chopin's uh, etudes. There's only one recording that I know of, uh, maybe two, but honestly, I haven't checked the second one. Uh, but there's two that I know of, of Chopin's etudes where the original tempos are followed nearly. And that's uh, uh, Polini's recording when he was uh, young, the, when he was 18, was it, or 17? Uh, and uh, Grigory Sokolov's live recordings. Um, everybody else plays them slower because simply they, they can't be played faster. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's difficult to believe that Chopin put a tempo marking that he knew basically nobody could play um you know but anyway i i, I don't I, I don't want to uh, get involved let's say <laughs> in the discussion mm -hmm. because you know i'm not an expert or anything like that but i'm, I'm aware of it and it certainly doesn't make our life any easier <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> oh. then in terms of you know I, I think I told you this before. Did, did, did you know that I used to learn the organ? Yes, you mentioned once. Yeah, yeah so I, I used to learn the organ under a very amazing scholar in Toronto, Dr. John Dirksen. I was very lucky to have met him. And he taught me all kinds of interesting things. And he taught me organ uh, for a whole year. I was very lucky about that. And the organ is a because it's not like a piano you don't have the dynamic control right so if you want to play louder or quieter on the organ you have to change the stops that you have pulled out some of the uh modern more modern organs have crescendo and decrescendo pedals so right. on one note you can but it's of course manipulated mechanically let's say not by the way you attack the keys so there's a uh, uh, quite a big technical difference in the way that you play the piano and the organ. Um, and so one of the pieces I was playing, it was a mass by Couperin, by François Couperin. And uh, like all French music of, the, uh, of that period, uh, there's a lot of ornaments, a lot of trills and a lot of these kinds of things. The French were 
famous for that for a long, long time. And I was playing the trills much like you would on a piano. So it's a very physical thing on a piano. You can you sort of use your whole arm, you know, to rotate. And you can see, I think, that my whole arm was kind of shaking on the mm. side. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a tremolo. So uh, it's, it, if I do it in an octave, if I slow it down, the movement is basically something like this. But then when you, when you speed it up, that kind of disappears, and you just see the beat. Yeah, and so the trills are, are played in much the same way on a piano. So it's a very physical, you're using your whole arm, you're kind of flapping your arms around like a, you know, like, like wings. And, um, but of course on the organ, if you play it like that, uh, he, he noticed that my trills were sounding very tense, very right. physical, very tense said, you know, just don't play them like that. And I kind of looked at him. I said, well, how am I supposed to do that? It's not a piano. <laughs> yeah. I can't change, you know. And he looked at it, He said, you know, it's very easy. Just imagine it first and then play and you'll see it'll be much better. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, he said it very lightly, but yeah. I tried immediately. It worked. And that was when I understood this idea of intention, you know, uh, like in a basic way, but it's like, well, I am now intended to play the trill less physically and without really changing anything in my uh, movement consciously, that's the way it came out. And so there's that whole aspect, you know, to, to intention as well. Um, right. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. No, it's very, very important to have, uh, you know, uh, to, to have such uh, insights as such, you know, because normally we, we tend to um, just listen to something, a piece, a symphony here and uh, any composition there without, I mean, Glenn Gould, for example, has been my, uh, I mean, one of my favorites. And uh, that narrative that you shared, that even uh, for uh, for for him, it took, you know, they would need uh, a considerable amount of time uh, to do that. But again, then if you couple it with some of the elders from our tradition, would say that mere mere practice, you know, is not enough. You need to have a thought process as well. You need to be a uh, scholar musician scholar uh, artists you know that that is very very important absolutely it's one of the things that i think i found i find kind of astounding about uh, you know gurbani sandeet is that there's so many elements of it that are really from the highest class of of music making you know i mean that kind of an idea it's not a it's not a commonplace idea at all mm -hmm. um, when you think about it from from a, the perspective of a musician that it, it's not just about physically playing through a piece right it's about having a whole background firstly of knowledge so the uh, uh, you know uh, one of the ideas I, I, I absolutely love when, when I first heard it from you was that to properly sing a particular Raga, you have to know others, many others, so that you don't uh, tinge it, the one that you're learning, with the, with the ones that are, let's say, could be similar to it in some way. Indeed. Uh, but you, cannot, you can't let the two combine. Now, uh, so you have to know many other things to be able to uh, uh, execute this one particular thing correctly. And this is an idea that, well, let's say Jeanette Fiarchuk told me as soon as I learned my first Beethoven sonata, mm -hmm. she said, Beethoven, you learn, the better you'll play Beethoven. And wow. it's, it's a very similar idea. You, you, you can't just say, I want to learn the 32nd sonata of Beethoven and, and sit down, learn the notes, memorize it, play it technically well. And, and, you know, and say, okay, now I know it. I mean, that's a very small part of the process. 
you have to know all of these other sonatas. The best thing would be it would be to know all of them, of course, one by one. Um, maybe that's what Chief meant about being old enough. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a it's a similar idea, isn't it? In terms of material that you're trying to execute correctly can't be executed unless you have this wide range of, let's say, peripheral knowledge uh, that let you not only interpret it but stay away from, let's say, in in, in our context, we'd say things like non-stylistic elements, right? So. If you play Chopin like you would play, sorry, if you play Beethoven like you would play Chopin, um, you can't do that. But you can only know that if you've already played Chopin and understood the style and, and all of these things. And you can't play early Beethoven like you would play late Beethoven. Mm. You, and, or you can't play Mozart like you can play Beethoven. And so you have to know you, all of this re repertory, and, but not just being able to play it, but understanding it, having thought about it. So how is Beethoven's form different than Mozart's form? Right. Technically, they're writing the same kind of piece. They're both writing sonatas. They're both writing theme and variations. But what's the difference between a Mozart variation and a Beethoven variation? You have to think about that and, and you know, gather all of the knowledge. So what, what do you think? Is that a similar idea to you? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You see, the, my experience has been very simple that wherever you are, uh, even, you know, different genres and all that, if you're, uh, one is one is just being a freelance musician, right? The Mazari uh, marketplace. But the moment you go, you start going higher and higher from a Bazari marketplace singer to, uh, to a Darbari, uh, or a court musician like, Right, those that etiquette, that demeanor of, of hierarchy and so on and so forth. But then the rebel incarnate, the Nirankari Gavaya or the protagonist. So between the three, very, very important. The one at the top, these guys are also thinkers. Uh, anything uh, that they touch has to be meaningful. Anything that they utter has to be meaningful. It cannot be bereft of uh, you know, a worthy meaning. So I'm so glad uh, to hear uh, such parallels and extraordinary parallels, not just ordinary parallels uh, with that, yeah. A absolutely, I think I mean, that's, it's so important to understand that. I think it's exactly like that. It's, you know, uh, I've had, I, you know, I, uh, I have some friends, for example, some string players, um, uh, violinists in particular, a few actually, mm -hmm. and, but, but this bad habit of uh, going off and touring with orchestras once in a while. Um, though while on tour, they, you know, play literally the same thing over and over again for a period of two months, every one or two days. And in, in my experience, these guys have come back from such a tour. Right. And they practically forgotten how to play, <laughs> you know, because at, at, for yeah. a few cons, we're just doing it automatically, right? Just to get through the night. <laughs> and, and it's, 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 it's really a shame. And so, um, the, you know, that's the kind of thing that we want to avoid. I think when, I mean, that I want to avoid when, when being a musician, um, y yeah, because it's, it's just, not very appealing to me, you know. I'd I'd rather hit wrong notes but have a thought behind it, than hit all the right notes but just be doing it automatically. And um, of course, the ideal is not to hit any wrong notes. Hmm. Um, but you know, uh, that that comes with a lot of practice, a lot of sitting in practice, and uh, that's that's just a question of time. Yeah, uh, but. The other things, uh, the, 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 the thinking, that's not uh, a question of time. That's something a little bit different. <laughs> that's something about uh, without, learning. Yeah. Without doubt, without doubt. Well, thank you for that. Absolutely. And um, time for 
some music, something that comes to your mind? So, yeah, so this, the, the Beethoven I played earlier, for example, there's, there's plenty of things that we can say about that. Um, the first thing I think that, that you might find very interesting is, is the count. Um, the, um, uh, how do you say, the time signature there at the beginning, it's, it's, on, it's on three, it's a compound time signature, but it starts with an upbeat. And basically, Beethoven, for the entire piece, is trying to disorient us, trying to confuse us as to where one is. So, because he doesn't start on one, he starts on three. So it goes... Uh, So you see, it's Beethoven trying to confuse us, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and then when the first variation starts, you know, interesting um, interpretive problem over there because normally the one uh, should be underlined it should be the most important part of the bar as such uh, but here clearly the melody is telling us to do something else the melody is on the high note isn't it so we would if we would sing it uh, and all vo vocal music this is something Raymond Spazowski used to tell me over and over and over again. He would say, all instrumental music is just trying its best to imitate vocal music. <laughs> Something that <laughs> I about, yeah, here also. That's very interesting that that's the experience also for them, yeah. So whatever you're playing... The entire you rag, rag is all vocal. It's not coming from the instrument. It is the instruments originally always emulated the voice. They followed the that's voice. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting for me to hear uh, from your part of the hemisphere. Oh, it's, it's something that, 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 uh, that unfortunately a lot of people uh, uh, you know, forget about in their instrumental playing and they play their instruments like instruments, which is maybe valuable you know, by itself, because it's very impressive and makes a lot of sound and all of that. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, Penderecki, the, one of the biggest composers in the 20th century, Polish, uh, he, he died, uh, I believe it was last year or two years ago, two years ago. Um, very close to his, uh, to his, uh, you know, demise. He was asked, like almost on his deathbed, he said, he was asked, what's the greatest instrument that exists? You know, because he was a contemporary composer and he wrote for literally everything. You know, he, he started out in film music in the 50s. And so he was writing on all these crazy synthesizers and, uh, you know, really old ones, went through the 60s, the 70s, all the classical instruments, a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, non-traditional instruments not contemporary ones, but from other traditions, including Indian instruments, 
and you know the Indonesian gamelan and all of these instruments that are kind of uh, uh, you know exotic let's say for Europe and his answer was there's a lot of very nice instruments a lot of very uh, interesting instruments but there's only one instrument that really counts and that instrument is the human voice and that's it and that was his answer and I think there's something very true about that no doubt about that um, so even when we're playing things that don't necessarily sound vocal, like this theme, for example, it's not a, let's say, not the first thing that comes to mind when you want to whistle something. <laughs> but um, if we don't have the, a theme that's particularly vocal, let's say, by nature, um, we still, I think, should sing it. And that's an important part of the process, to understand where to take a breath, uh, and very often, the shape of the melody uh, suggests how we should phrase it. So, where we should get louder and where we should get softer. So, when we sing this melody, uh, clearly the, the melodic note is the high note. And so, you would sing something like... Tita... Um, And then even more, and less there. And then, you know, you try to emulate that in a much nicer voice than mine, on the piano, of course. And so you have the emphasis on the top note. so on. But like I was just saying, the melody note is actually on the weak beat of the bar. And so we, now we have a very difficult interpretive problem. You know, should I put the emphasis on the one and ignore the melody, say something like... downbeat uh, more audible for the audiences or should I play it like a melody and I mean to me the answer is quite obvious play it like a melody and Beethoven wanted the to confuse the audience to as to where the one was because he's doing that for the whole piece and it uh, so you know but, but it's, it is a very interesting interpretive problem and it, the same thing with the first variation so do I play you do it on the downbeat so and so on and so it's quite uh, problematic it, 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 or it can be in, in some ways and and so we have to figure out ways of, of playing it in our own way uh, now this this deception I think is rhythmically very interesting as, as I'm sure you've heard uh, uh, in, in, in when I was playing it, in some very key passages, because so the first variation is quite simple. The beats are subdivided into three, right? right. So, so we, we have, have one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two,
Yeah. And in the second in the second variation, the beats now are not all of a sudden subdivided into six. Mm. And so we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. It's a really shocking rhythm for that time. Uh, how he hides, there's no one for an entire bar there. And yeah. then he comes back to it. I thought that would be, I thought you'd find that very interesting. <laughs> right. yeah. So you have the uh, one, two, three. Beethoven playing around with his uh, listeners' ex uh, 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 expectations. Mm. The the amazing part of it is that it's just it's a natural progression of where he started. Because if you listen to the first rhythm, so that um, uh, one two three one, that's all it is. One two three one two three. Two. So it's 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 a diminution of that rhythm. It's basically twice as fast. Instead of on three, it's on six. And then of course he does the next extreme thing, and instead of leaving at six, he goes to twelve. Yeah. So uh, the, just to play the end of the six, uh, uh, oh, and also um, it, this uh, second variation is basically in four voices. There are four separate voices, and uh, right towards the end there, you can really hear the joy of four-part writing. You know, it's almost like he's writing for a quartet or even an orchestra. Right. You have this wonderful imitation. You have this right hand left hand, right hand, left hand. Of course, <laughs> that's my reading of it, but, but it, I, I think, think it really works. works. So you have...
musicians can only count to three or four in Europe. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> but it's the, it's of course the diminution of the same rhythm. It's still on three, just in, now the beat is divided into 12. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Further interesting about these variations is that they're um, um, all supposed to be played in the same tempo. That's right. marked very clearly Beethoven. So that's why this subdivision of three and six and twelve is uh, factual. It's not just my imagination. I mean, he wrote listesso tempo before every variation, so that means the same tempo. Yeah. So you cannot change the tempo, play the 12 slower, because, you know, you have to make the decision very early. And of course, after the 12 finishes in this very kind of a jumpy... Beethoven's trying to hide the first beat from us. So now the subdivision goes to nine. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, three. And the right hand plays a figure where the, the two is most important. So the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Interesting, very rhythmically surprising part as well. Yeah. Uh, quite maniac, quite maniacal, don't you think? It's amazing, yeah. That it's just it's Beethoven. No, it's a really my you know one's head bows to such geniuses who've um, you know cast a web so exciting. There's a symmetry to it, and then they break that symmetry and then yet recreate uh, a symmetry out of that breaking of that symmetry. Uh, it's some fantastic minds. What imagination. That's, that's exactly what it is. And, and again, he was totally deaf. Yeah, this is, this is something <laughs> very unique. <laughs> It is indeed, it is indeed. And so, and also uh, look at the, in terms of imagination, we saw that uh, the theme is, every part of it is repeated twice. There's two lines, let's say, to it. Both lines are repeated twice. Uh, and that's true of every variation. And here, that wasn't enough for Beethoven. He's like, I'm not gonna repeat the same thing twice anymore. Uh, because his, you know, he's exploding. He, he, he has so many ideas. And so we have this contrasting where we, we finish in a very, in this low register, uh, right? Uh, how, how does it go there?
register part that I just played there, that's actually the repeat of the theme, which was first played in that low register and ended there. Right. It has that sequence that goes up. So it's a completely contrasting idea. And then he repeats those two completely contrasting <laughs> ideas again for the second line of the theme. Um, and, you know, it's easy to believe, I mean, sorry, it's easy to understand why some musicologists call Beethoven the first impressionist, isn't it? With these kinds of... very it's difficult to call that a, 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 a melody isn't it it's, it's difficult to call it really anything it's it's like a blur of these very delicate and high notes <laughs> so it's it's more like an impression than a line and so like I said it, it gives that gives that impetus to that kind of thought um, so it's really quite an amazing piece now that's all of course the, the beat is uh, subdivided into nine and and this nine stays and stays and stays until this you know sublime climax uh, where, where we have it uh... yeah let me try it again the climax of the theme that we hear in the second line and it's just so pretty and you know way at the top of the register remember the Beethoven's piano ended just a fourth higher than that yeah. and so it's there for those times and uh, these just really pretty and, and delicate and magical kind of sequences and uh, that's where that's that's where he gets to it and and then follows the only time that he actually breaks uh, the theme and variations sequence. Uh, you know, it starts with this very orchestral, by all uh, measure of the of the word, parts where. It... I learned from Bogumil Novitsky, one of my other teachers, uh, he studied in Vienna with Hans Graf, the conductor. So he had a lot of knowledge about Beethoven that's not so easy to come across, you know, if you don't study like Hans Graf. Um, and he learned from Hans Graf that those sections that we have, that we cut, do come across in Beethoven uh, solo piano pieces once in a while, with these long, drawn-out trills, uh, which are the focus of the music, because sometimes they're an accompaniment, uh, but when they're the focus of it, th those parts were actually meant for the, uh, the player, for the uh, performer. They were meant to be improvised. So that's a very interesting insight. Uh, there was a section here that was meant to be improvised, and especially yeah. sections, notes uh, that are very sparse, you know, like... Very 
distant notes. Those are those were meant to be sections improvised on those particular chords. So that's an insight that I think gives gives a, a lot to think about. And I wouldn't dare improvise. <laughs> I, I think the I'm not five <laughs> because of that. Too too uh, too well known music for things like that, but. Uh, just to have that insight, I think, is a very important one because it showed that something about Beethoven, you know, that he was giving the performers really that even though he was so intense on writing scores with a lot of precise marks and precise metronome markings, like we said earlier, and, and, and exact dynamics and all of this, that even him, he left this part that, okay, here you can, you can do whatever you like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that tells us something about Beethoven that we don't hear often, you know. Right. We often mean conductor that would yell at people because they weren't playing his music properly because often they didn't know how to play it. Um, it was lovely. You know, uh, it was it was yeah. one from Cheslov. I think it was fantastic to to start this series of conversation, yeah. and uh, and I. Uh, look forward to connecting again in the next days when you're back in London, I guess. Uh, and then uh, we'll continue this conversation on Beethoven. Uh, yeah, I like that very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, my best wishes also for the anniversary that you guys are going to be celebrating. Um, yeah. And uh, give my regards to your mom and we all miss your dad <laughs> and uh, um, uh, we'll talk soon. We'll meet soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you for taking time out and thank your friend. Uh, uh, thanks to your friend who, uh, you know, whose studio, uh, you know, I've stayed here. I'm feeling, I've been watching you play, uh, you know, we practice so much here feeling like yeah. home. Anyway, I've stayed there for more than, I don't know, what, two weeks or something. I was there in the same flat here. Yeah. So my regards to everyone uh, and at the Our Place Foundation. And I look forward to connecting soon. And then we continue this conversation on compositions, preparation, improvisation, interpretation. It's very, very important. I think this is going to be very, very important conversations for students to listen to. Hmm. What is touchable, what is not, <laughs> that is very important. Uh, what is worthy of interpretation, what is, uh, you know. I hope so. I hope so. I hope it will be valuable to, to, to you know, to, and, 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 and even, even uh, I, I've enjoyed this very much, this exchange that we've had, and some of the parallels that you can make, I think, are also very helpful and very uh, insightful. So I hope this continues, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I look forward to seeing you soon, yeah? <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Friends, that was my conversation with uh, pianist and composer Czesław Bala Singh. He, he joined me live from Pozna and Poland, and I Hope that you've enjoyed the conversation, uh, uh, continued conversation. I had a wonderful session last year, and I'm so glad that I was able to steal him uh, from, from his own recording session. Uh, he's uh, doing something with Dr. Stefania Passamonte uh, at the new university, which has been founded by Stefania. And um, I'm, I'm just glad that we were able to uh, kidnap Chesla for a few minutes. Um, thank you for watching. Kindly share uh, um, um, this conversation and join me on Patreon. Support the conservation work at the Anath Foundation by way of that. And several categories you can participate in in monthly, yearly subscription. And uh, follow me on Twitter, on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, as you know, and also on YouTube. Do subscribe to my channel and let's keep this conversation rolling. Uh, 
خدا حافظ نمسکار ویری گڈ نائٹ واہ جی کا خالصہ واہ جی فتح سات کا پیار چسلا وی کین سی یو ویر آر یو وائی یو ہائڈنگ لائک دا او آئی سی آئی نو واٹ آئی ڈیٹ واز مائی فالٹ او لک ایٹ دیٹ یو واٹ از واٹ از رانگ وی آر آل سلکی ٹوڈے I'm very yeah. okay. I thought uh, you le- you yelled at me last time so I thought <laughs> yeah, yeah you are you such a I don't know what t-shirt you are wearing I mean come on <laughs> So I thought I'd try to play a joke and here I am in silk <laughs> It's not iron huh by the way Yeah well it was <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah So I, uh, this, this kurta that I wear is um, Gurlev, you know, my nephew um, uh, insisted that he's getting it for me once when I had wanted to uh, get one. But, but so this is him. Anyway, that was a lovely, it was a, um, I mean, it, it's taken like what, four days for me to edit the whole thing. And, uh, but it, what did you think of the edits? Was it good? Oh yeah, I mean, you can't really notice. And it'll be our secret, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it so, I was yeah, also, no, it's good. I think at one time I was like so sleepy. I think I was listening and then I did like this. And I have actually <laughs> sifted through the entire video thinking, did I, did I get caught? <laughs> did, did, was I caught napping? You know, <laughs> so even now I, while watching, I was thinking, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I don't, I, that scene is not there. That, that clip is not there. <laughs> Busy. Well, you know, it's, it's a good sign if your audience falls asleep at a concert. So <laughs> that was not because of your playing silly. It was because for oh. two days I hadn't slept and you decided to like only give time when it was like what passed. midnight here and i had been yeah, slept 46 7 hours i was like very at the times when you don't see me i'm actually up like doing <laughs> waking myself up drinking water you know <laughs> and anyway that was there was a it was fun anyway any any thoughts you have you would like to share with everybody you've seen some of the well, comments, uh, everybody is here. Um, yeah I was I was looking at them a little earlier and uh, it, and you know, it looks like everything is really positive which is great I think I think it's rightfully being observed right that the audio and the video is is as you know on a, on a different level this time so that's what we wanted to do and so that's really good that that that's happened and and uh, you know being appreciated by people um, yeah and I think that's that's the uh you know that's the the so i i hope this this becomes a precedent for you and you can no, keep uh, having all these no, awesome the, conversations no, you know no precedent in the sense that i have already tried uh, uh you know recording sessions earlier uh the problem is that everybody doesn't have the equipment right at right. times people don't even have a smart but there's so many people i want to i wanted to you know uh converse with but there are problems with either that they don't have like smartphones at least which is required you know i mean it requires a good camera a decent camera on the phone uh, right the second is that uh, then there's a wifi issue like the other day when i was in conversation with mithu sai uh, the dolchi from lahore i mean just an outstanding player i mean he's a pride uh, of of uh, you know punjab uh, and but the problem was they were in a cellar I mean, in the basement, and they were using uh, some hotspot issue in the basement, which is not coming. And he and his student, and I told her that please don't, I mean, just like because the signal is so weak, do not use multiple phones. Then I found on her own page, she had been, uh, you know, uh, telecasting live on her own Facebook page. Oh, and so then I was I taking some of the signal. Then she was trying to match; it would go off. I told her not to do that. Even she defied, and there were like issues like that. So it becomes such an um, it's a nightmare, uh, a, a, you know, in all these conditions. But fortunately, oh, I... you had access to microphones, a you know, an interface that could record on the laptop. Uh, we had that a stereo paired mic, uh, mic, uh, you know, microphone system. 
and then we had uh, but then the problem is that you were not mic'd so that was That's the right. issue i'd spent extra time on that because we had to then i decided in the end to uh request uh, amar you know to to sort of uh, uh to also treat that and he found issues with the live record live i mean sound from the phone um he was able to remedy that so thanks to him as well i mean, did a fantastic job to match the two uh, videos i think there was some highs which were which went over i'll have to look back and i'll have to show it to him uh, towards the end when you were when both the sounds were meeting i think there was a peak uh, i think it went over but yeah there's no question that if we have uh, a miking if we mic separately and we post produce it uh, and i was able to you know uh, treat the video uh, uh, sync uh, as well uh, Uh, color corrected sharpen it etc you know use i use a kodak uh, uh you know uh, filter uh, to to make yeah the colors came out really nice they, they were uh, i was able to manage the highlights because that light from the top it was sexy but it was a little too harsh uh, mm-hmm. it was it was like the keys uh, when i was um, approaching you from your left uh, the mm-hmm. ref- it was a bit much and when i i tried as much but i there was no information it was just burned out so there were there were lighting issues but i think uh, the bricks at the back i mean they really came out so well uh they did uh, maybe i can show uh, uh that that image uh, uh let me see if i can um <laughs> now because we we had that uh, um i i shared with you, you know that the comparison between the two uh uh-huh. yeah we yeah, i can yeah this one i think let's see so this mm-hmm. uh, example folks the um the difference between the two and uh right yeah i mean look at the look at uh, the, the bricks that you mentioned in the back they're so much better in the in the one on the right so right. much nicer right. yeah yeah no doubt about that so the uh, whole thing was about that and the key on the right and look at the left um uh, it's it's my the wood you know the wood color the bricks at the back you know, this is how naturally we see but when the reflection is there there's haze in between is when the issue is uh, when it goes away i mean uh, so that that much we were able to manage uh, that was i think uh, cool about that and uh, what else any other thoughts that you would like to share with with uh, everybody well i mean not i mean i you know i i really hope everybody enjoyed it and these kinds of things and uh you know it was it was plenty of work we had fun doing it well i had fun i don't know if you had fun but uh, <laughs> it was too late <laughs> for fun <laughs> but uh um yeah and and you know it was it it was uh, it's a very pretty place of course so we had that big advantage yeah, like you said you stayed there before so you remember it's a really nice place to to work in and and um yeah it's got those you know everything that that's needed and uh, so so that's that's really good and and playing there it always comes out really well uh, though the piano has its own issues it's it's a very light piano you know the the touch is very light and i i prefer very heavy pianos because i kind of play i, I always find that i sound better when i when my fingers have to work more I and see. over there it's 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 a very delicate uh mechanism and so it's always challenged for me um uh nothing wrong with it it's just a preference really um uh, but yeah it's it's more challenging for me and then um and then of course the tuning issues Yeah that right, was because it was I a hard day to tell everybody and... that you had a nightmare I mean spent extra half an hour because the uh, highs there was a note in the highs which was just playing and you and I was like so afraid during you know our conversation I was hoping it doesn't go but I think um uh, it didn't it it held because you had it you, did yeah it did that particular time, one uh, you know yeah. in the lead up to our uh, uh, you know <laughs> recording so that that was that was an issue also because there's no air conditioning and uh, that has it's it's at the top uh, and that That's right. that has that plays with the strings and and also with the size i think expansion yeah. and it also matters a lot 
Well, that's right. I mean, it's wood, so wood is moving all the time when the temperature changes, and wood and of course, metal both, both move. Sorry, wood and metal both react to change. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly, yeah. So the so the, the frame uh, and the tuning pins, they're they're metal on the piano, so they're they're all very very fluent. Though I found that that humidity really has a bigger influence on instruments. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, but but temperature as well and. And so it was a hot day, and, and like you said, it's in the attic. And uh, well, and actually, the, the note that uh, that I had worked on before stayed in tune, but another one went out. <laughs> but that's okay. That's that's just how it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, it's. I think it's also really nice because it's all really uh, part of the process, you know. And now it's basically, you know, I don't want to belittle anybody, uh, but. But basically, it's very easy to get a very good recording, a very a pristine recording in a concert hall. All you need is a couple of microphones, a Logic, you know, which is now like standard with Mac, and and uh, you know, cut cut and paste pieces together until you get the sound that you want. Uh, it's it's so I I, I kind of like the the messy the messiness, you know. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it gives it like an authentic character, you know. <laughs> the um, one thing I have to tell you, um, you know, you know a lot. <laughs> How do you mean? <laughs> you know, you don't know that you know a lot. No, I mean, I mean, know a lot. Like and... What we call it is a takia kalam. When you're uh, when you're speaking, you know. Uh, here it is. You know. Uh, would you like a glass of? Uh, you know. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to be pointing. You know. You know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have these uh, ticks, you could say, <laughs> when I'm trying to enunciate clearly. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was one thing that stood out for me. <laughs> it was anyway. Um, what what else is happening? I know that you your recital is soon. I saw that wonderful, um, um, you know, uh, the poster has come up. The flyer mm. for your recital. Uh, what date is it for those in London? It's the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the twenty second of July. Right. So it's just in a couple of weeks. At uh, it's a Thursday, at seven p.m. And uh, so yeah, it's 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 going to be happening. That's very exciting, and I'll be playing what what we what we spoke about and played a little bit of, and it's uh, you know in its entirety. So it yeah. should be. I mean, it'll be great. I mean, I would love to record. You know, to to sort of we should we should plan that maybe after your concert. I'd love to have you play the entire thing. You know. For our for our records as well, that would be that would be wonderful. You played a I, I don't know what you played one portion of one full a twenty minute section. How what is the full? It's like an hour plus or what? Yeah, it'll be it'll be I think a little bit over an hour. Yeah, uh, depends on the exact tempos I take, but an hour and ten minutes, an hour and fifteen, uh -huh. no 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 more than an hour and twenty I think for all three. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm not planning to take a break, uh, so that's going to be a, a challenge too, um, just to get through them. Uh, but that's that's part of it, I think. You know, uh, Beethoven. Be there, there's this with Beethoven. I think a, a big part of the expression is the is the work, the hard work that goes into the playing. It's not like when you play Chopin and it should sound kind of effortless, and that this is how it was meant to be anyway. With Beethoven, sometimes it has to sound like, this is a lot of work, this is difficult. <laughs> I think that's a, a big part of, some, sometimes a big part of his expression. So I, I'm hoping that if I play all three, you know, back to back, it'll add some of that effort uh, right. into the expression as well. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I have to ask you one question. Like, uh, when I listen to uh, my friend, uh, you know, Juliana Sorsha, for example, uh, Juicy Caruso, uh, you know, um, who's a scholar and a musician, and, 
even Karine Pogoshan, uh, you know, pianists that I've known, like Dave Frank, and they're like very expressive. Uh, but when you play, you're like very almost like detached. I mean, you hold back the emotions. You're you're not you don't that style the you know the the bang behind the bang. <laughs> if I may, not really call. Uh, what's to do with it? Is it your style or is it like your training? You're told not to like to be very sort of very, very um, um, sort of composed in a way, not to let go or not to flow. Uh, almost at times. Uh, uh, so there are two parts to my uh, point. When you were talking about the, uh, you know, the movement and the wings, that was very revealing as well. So then there is a movement. You're letting go. You're you're fluttering your wings as well. But at other times, I see that you are a witness to the playing rather than being played. The one who's being played. Uh, how do you? It's like your hands are like a painting. You no, know, sometimes you have those animation films. You put your hands. Your hand goes in time, like almost like interstellar. Uh, like, uh, you know, some of the animation films I've been analyzing and studying, there's one in which there's a painting, there's a, uh, you know, bird in the painting that comes out but has to be put back, the hand goes in and there's something very fluid and malleable and then the uh -huh. hand comes out. So it's almost like your hands are in there, uh, sometimes up to your arms and uh, your shoulder, but you're out, like you're in and out both. You're in a twilight zone. Uh, tell me about that. I mean, that was something that I felt. I may be wrong, but you tell me if I'm wrong or right or... Well, I, I think, um, I mean, there's, there, there, that's a very interesting thing to talk about here. So, so I, I mean, I've found that movements at, at the piano when I'm playing, you know, that kind ben of... Gold, uh, the, like ben Gould, he just melts in it, like he's like the melting water. You, yeah. you take ice and you've uh, placed on, on the sun, you know, <laughs> he's melting gladly. Uh, That's right. That's right. Now, Gould is, Gould is a very, very particular example because he was so eccentric in the way that he was sat even and, and also moved and everything. But I think generally speaking, so from my experience, uh, movements at the piano, for the most part, and this isn't speaking about everybody, of course, but for the most part are a very practiced and rehearsed thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's this. So there, there, there isn't this spontaneity to them. It's, it's, it's. Uh, and, and now the, the big pianists, like if you take somebody like Ashkenazi, and you see how he play when he plays, he's making facial movements all the time that look very much like a nervous tick. Mm -hmm. Like he's kind of you know it's he's very nervous and trying to all the notes you know and, and these kinds of things. Uh, but th then, in terms of the really extrovert pianists, like like Long Long Lang Lang, for example, I think it's pronounced Long Long, you know, and 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 uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, people that dislike him not so much for his playing, but for his movements, <laughs> which I think is is, uh, is is also telling. But when we look at really the genesis of the movements, I think we have to at the piano at least we have to think about Liszt. So. Uh, there's all these caricatures of Liszt from his time when he's, you know, bent really close over the keys like this, or when he's got and he's really back and his head is in his hair is you know flying and <laughs> he's he's doing these kinds of things. So at that time we already had the beginning of the concert life really, uh, and the concert performer. So these things were were like the added element. They were part of the performance, a bit of the theater. But I, I, I tend to think um, a little bit that, like, w when I play, um, the relationship that I'm trying to show isn't the relationship that I have with my instrument. Of course, you can't avoid it because I'm actually playing the instrument. So, you know, there's that relationship. And, but to focus on the relationship that I have with the actual music or with the composer and that relationship isn't 
really a physical one. Of course, it, it, that's the medium because the instrument is physical and you have to push the keys and all of this. But, but I think that the focus should always be on that. And I think that might be part of the reason why you could call my uh, afflictions or inflections uh, sort of minimal, right? Um, it isn't something that I'm doing consciously. It's, I'm trying to pay very much attention to how I play. Uh, so what's coming out of the instrument and what I should do next and all of these kinds of things. And I found that the distractions take away from that. So it, it becomes, uh, the, the movement, sorry, they take away from that. They distract from that relationship. They're, they're more about the relationship with the instrument. And, you know, that I have to raise my arm this much so that it comes down at, at you know, and then and these kinds of things. And, of course, sometimes that's part of the technique. So syncopations are much that the, the most natural to get a syncopation uh, correct is by actually raising your hand off the keys and letting it fall, mm -hmm. because there's a time element to a syncopation, and so there's a, you're, because you're a little bit later just because you're making the movement, um, you know there's so but that's a, of course a very different case. Uh, but when we're talking about swooning and, uh, you know, those kinds of movements, I feel that sometimes they're necessary, but the, uh, the process that they're, that they're come to uh, is always one for me, that sometimes it's what the music does to me and not what I do to the music. And I think that's the relationship there that, um, yeah, that, 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 uh, yeah. So, so I think that might be part of why I, I move so little, um, in terms of pedagogy, I mean, there's some teachers that actually, uh, encourage, you know, certain movements or say in this place, uh, because there's an element of theater, you know, there's, for example, Richter once said, Sviatoslav Richter. Uh, he said once that uh, his one of his, I think his uh, only or most important teacher, Newhouse, said that when you are playing the Liszt sonata in public, the right. big B minor Liszt sonata, that you should enter onto the stage, sit at the piano, keep your hands st still over the beginning notes without playing them, right. and count to 30 in your head. So you're building up that anticipation from the audience. Mm -hmm. There's that element of theater that, oh, he's going to play, but he's going to count to 30 first in his head. So the audience is really waiting on their edge of their seats. Is like, oh, when is he going to start the piece? So I, I, there is an element of theater, but the same guy, Richter, uh, towards the end of his uh, career, he used to play with all of the lights off no stage lights and uh, so in the dark basically and he'd have a little reading lamp uh, set up just on the keys so he could see what he was doing and if he was playing with the score which he also often did so that he could see the score and the, he wanted people to see as little as him of possible because he used to say that well, when they see me and they see all of my all of the, all, the, all the, that they're seeing is the work and there's nothing special about the work, you know, it should be in the, in the, in the sonic, uh, the focus should be on the sonic material. So, I mean, I think that that's the way that I would try to begin to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, for example, let me see if I can do something about it here. I don't know. Um, so this is, for example, the Pakhavaj. I'm. Let me see if I can raise my chair. Um, you can't really see. So, playing the Pakhavaj, for example, I don't have the ata. So, uh, can I? Um, it's obviously not in tune uh, as much as I would like. Let me see if I can grab something to raise the height. Um, so one, for example, in playing, 
is so dha du ge na ta tre ta is play right but then there is something which uh, it, it's similar with singing for example hmm? so dha du ge ta so na ta tre ta ka ka the sense of uh, uh, nothingness basically uh, tal and uh, uh, the kal akal uh, so uh, this movements for example uh, are um, a very very uh, intrinsic as far and then i'm not doing it right ah, when, when many people are copying my, my work they would do like this and then raise the hand <laughs> like this right but it's not like that it's just a total bounce it's like i don't do anything it's just it's in a as if in a, in a of course it comes with a lot of i don't know practice part of the pedagogy of course uh it's not something you do it happens so tell me about it i mean how is it that uh, how how is it for you in that sense i i think that's that's uh, that's exactly the the we're talking about the same thing so uh, the there part there are kinds of music say or pieces of music maybe um that require uh, you know extra musical um movement or because the the general rule of technique and i'm sure this is true uh, um of uh you know the pickaway or 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 the very many other instruments that you play the basics of technique is economy of movement isn't it so you you make every movement as economical as possible because otherwise you're wasting energy that's the basic rule but there are some movements there are some things that you need to perform that require the opposite of that and so raising your hand happens also is... when there is space hmm. so uh, if i'm playing for example a composition which is um, going at uh, you know if i'm going at 64 beats per minute and i'm playing something which is 32 times that pace so uh, then there is no movement but then there are uh, there are uh, spaces um, slow movements within that in which there's a there's a there's a uh, for example dha 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 so dha 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 so then there is the dha they said uh, it could either be a stillness tahan so even that is part uh, or that 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 da 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 so 1 so even in this movement i saw that there is da 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 you are moving only when it is about to be played so mm. in between from that movement to the other i did not see a wave in your tangible um um uh, self but uh, it is because the music is flowing in that pace i can see the movement in your subtle self in your subtle mm. body that means your spirit in your mind is there but the tangible self is not flowing is not revealing it's like uh, it's it's veiled so uh, uh, that interested me a lot when i was uh, watching you play I think it's exactly the, I think you you you've hit on it exactly because all of the processes that are going on in in my mind or in my intention right it's all there so I I I 
it should be all there. Sometimes you get distracted, of course, but it's all there. So you're you're counting, or or you're just. I mean, counting is is the first step, isn't it? Once you practiced enough, then you're a little bit like a bird who's flying over a, a big field of all the technical difficulties that you had to jump over first, but now you just see the whole thing from above. And so there's, there's no, you don't, you're not dealing with that anymore. You know, William Aid, uh, I had a master class with him only once. And he told, he told me a lot of very useful things. Uh, uh, he was the head of the piano department in Toronto at the University of Toronto for like 25 years or something like that. So mm -hmm. important Torontonian, let's say, he, um, he told me that he found that audiences always found his music more moving when on stage he wasn't emotionally involved in it. And... Uh, Right. At that time, it, it, it didn't make so much, it was a hard thing to understand because I was like, how? Because it's so emotional. There's so much, you know, tension and, you know, all these things going on. And But I think, uh, I think he's right. And it's not only in front of audiences, it's also in front of yourself. Um, now, that doesn't mean that in the process of learning and, uh, you know, uh, reading and then memorizing and all of these things that you do that during that process you become emotionally attached to the piece but when you're actually playing it um, there has to be this element of being apart from it and observing from distance almost what you're doing um, because otherwise you you emotions tend to make you make decisions on the fly, let's say while performing, mm -hmm. and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're the wrong decision to make when you think about, let's say, objective elements of the music. So you'll make a decision in one part of the structure because you're feeling particularly inclined to do so, and then you'll not make that same decision in the same part, but later on in the piece. And so that deals a blow to the integrity of the structure of the music right. um, that wouldn't have been there if you'd kept, uh, you know, if you'd kept that distance a little bit. Um, because at the end of it, the performer is just the intermediary. That's the way I see it. I know that, you know, the, the whole school of virtuosity and, and, you know, celebrity musicians, they don't really think of it like that because the artist is the most important. But really especially when you're playing other people's music and especially when you're playing people's such people like beethoven's music right you you you, you can't think of yourself uh, on the in the same way that you think of beethoven right because it's really about his music and sure your take on his music absolutely because you're playing it but the um yeah the the hierarchy has to remain there mm -hmm. um uh, otherwise, it's it's um, you know it, it's it's a show off, which is also worthwhile, right? Because there's sometimes it's it's very nice to go and watch a virtuosic performance, and you're like totally taken away by how awesome this guy's instrumental or this lady's instrumental prowess is. That's also valuable um, in some ways, but uh, it's it's not really what the, the the goal that I'm trying to get to. It's not the path that I try to take. It comes from a little bit of a different place. So if I play in an improvised concert, which I sometimes do, you know, with free jazz musicians or if we're doing, uh, you know, contemporary classical improv or um, then, yeah, then I can show off as much as I want, right? Because it's, right. it's about what's going on in the moment. But as soon as you're playing somebody else's music, even if they're in the audience, I mean, even if they're still there, even if the stature isn't as big as somebody like Beethoven, there's it's a different kind of relationship that you have to that music. Right. And um, I think this is something that you can also tell us a little bit about, right? Because, um, I mean, there's a there's a vast difference, I, I, I would imagine, in um, improvised sections. So like in the Ala section, um, which is also not really about the performer though, isn't it? It's about the, the rag itself. And 
exposing the the uh, you know uh, subtleties of of the the rag the rag's behavior let's say uh, but then but yeah but when you when we get then to the composition when the composition is sung in that part of the performance i think that that we can that there's another parallel isn't there in terms of it it's no longer really the performer right it's it's about the composition and the expression of the composition and and the words there yeah no it is uh, i mean there are uh, both uh, uh, stories uh, involved uh, there are times as i said there are times when uh, rhythmically as i mentioned that when there is a um, very fast paced uh, sequence that is going on uh, you cannot there's no movement there's no space to go uh, you know uh, to 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 sort of fly right to 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 spread your wings in a way um uh, but uh, but then there is also the space where you are um uh, playing uh, a slow tempo there is a pause in between uh, what we call uh, like mishr it's like the thop di taan or mishr mishr lay where you are going uh, uh, from let's say 60 or 64 68 68 bpm um you're playing 32 times that means in each beat you yeah, are 32 syllables mnemonic syllables uh being being beaded and um um and then what are you doing in that there is no space for that so the hand cannot fly away because the next mnemonic syllable is demanding its presence but then mm-hmm. if you have then within that tha di tha or tha da bol ஆஸ்பெக்ட்ஸ் <laughs> the other point i wanted to add to that this i have already already alluded to the other is when you are in a uh, melancholy uh, uh, you know uh, sort of um, an ambience in the sense that you are performing when let's say it is the death anniversary of of a grand master or uh, last rites of someone near and dear and you are performing i mean you are not dancing and celebrating so you are playing is much measured in the sense that even if there is a flair there is a movement that movement you are you are in a meditative meditative state and um, uh, the movements are only as much uh, to to sort of render uh, 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 there is a there is a nikas i mean you are a, we actually um, um, control the uh, the the spread of the sound with that movement because it is in the follow through of that uh the entire uh, uh gesticulation or the mudra as we uh would refer to i don't know if that mm-hmm. well i i i think this is exactly it because it's it's really about um you, you know like 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 we've said there's some performance or some pieces or some performance practice that demand certain movements right so for example uh, there's a um uh th- there's an accent in european music called a rinforzato a rinforzato is how is it different from a sforzato so a sforzato is a is a accent with dynamics mm-hmm. so you underline the note or the chord or whatever has a sforzato over it with a, a slightly stronger dynamic so it's louder uh than it's the the notes before immediately before and after it right a rinforzato is an accent with time so you don't accent the note with uh, a dynamic you accent it with being slightly late slightly later than it should but of course you can't be really late right because that would mess with the integrity of the beat uh right of the tempo of the music mm-hmm. so you have to be just so subtly late that there is that accent with time 
but it's it doesn't you know damage the integrity of the rhythm and uh, probably the easiest way to do that not the easiest is the wrong word the most natural way of doing that because of course and this is what you said about those who copy your work you can measure it you can lift your hand on purpose and then you know <laughs> put it down at that particular but that's that's not a natural way of doing it you have to do it in in the space that the piece allows right and and the way to do that is quite simply just raising your hand and letting it fall like you would on your knee and just that extra you know millisecond or two that it takes for your hand to fall back to the place that it should that's a rin for time and so so there are performance practices that demand those extra movements let's say um yeah I mean, for us, they're not actually a part of the bowl. They're part of the that's right. Yeah. Part of the um, part of the composition, in which uh, the mudra is a part of it. Like, for example, if I'm speaking, there will be some gesticulation, uh, depending on the feeling that I have. Um, so, uh, I was uh, the reason why I thought that I, I'll because that that is very remarkable. I mean, you have your style, you have your way of playing it. And the melody is having the same impact, but you seem to be almost like a puppeteer uh, uh, rather than the puppet and the play. Uh, you know, you're, you're sort of outside the arena, even when you're in there. Uh, that was quite, quite, uh, you know, uh, evident and visible for me. I'm very glad you noticed that. It's something that I try. I try to take the... I see I, I, I didn't really succeed in taking the focus off of me, but <laughs> you still noticed me. <laughs> but, but, but actually, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that I like it the way you do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sort of saying that I like or don't like. I saw that there was a, uh, there's a, there's a remarkable kind of a departure from what I've heard many others play. They are into it. And I wanted your insights about what is it that you have in mind uh, and that sort of, because you are a performer, you've gone through the same miles that many of, uh, uh, many of the others have uh, um, gone through a few years plus minus just because of the age seniority. Uh, but the regimen, the pedagogy is the same. And I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, uh, you know, a piece of your mind on that. Uh, what have you uh, thought about it? Uh, for me, you know, um, uh, I uh, one is being like a plastic to water in rain, you know, is like being a raincoat. Uh, I would rather be uh, the dress that gets drenched. Uh, mm. It's important to have a raincoat at times when you must not get wet. Uh, so that's the play that it adds to the dynamic uh, within that. At times you are getting drenched, at times you're on a boat, not a single drop of water that catches you. Um, uh, for me, it, it, the, the entire dynamic range is very, very uh, interesting and exciting, uh, the reason why I checked. Um, anyway, you're well, back in, uh, Paul, but you, if you have any thought about that, yeah, then we... We'll, oh, uh, no, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to agree with you. And just to clarify, I also don't think there's a... Uh, there's like a particular better way of doing it one or one way or the other. But I think that, I think it's, I think the only thing that, that is to be said is that it should come from the music. So if, if the music kind of demands a particular thing in the performer, then by all means, but often I see, and it's true of, of a lot of pianists and a lot of other instrumentalists as well, that the, the movements, aren't they come from the performer so it would it wouldn't be like the rain is getting my set me wet it would be like i'm making the rain get me wet you know <laughs> some, are, some, are already, some are already wearing very sexy bikinis on stage <laughs> <That's true. laughs> as if as if That's that true. is enough to play music <laughs> i mean exactly. i salute exactly. to the talent and hard work no doubt but that is also happening literally people are taking a little too serious to the rain that that rains <laughs> that's right that's right so so that would be the only 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 thing so i think that uh yeah yeah absolutely good
I have uh, friends, uh, thanks to our very dear friend, uh, Poonam Mayub. I have a um, uh, sad news to share that my very dear uh, friend and uh, who's like a brother, uh, Naeem Rana, the former defense minister of Pakistan, has passed away. Um, I was to go, uh, where was I? I was to go here. Uh, this is uh, Naeem Rana. I just uh, uh, spent, when Chesler was talking, I went on the net to get this uh, um, photo of his in office at the time. And uh, there are so many more photos. This is uh, Naeem and Anj, uh, Anjum Rana uh, together here. My heartfelt condolences. Uh, to the entire family, especially their lovely and beautiful daughter, Nini. There's a photo, a very beautiful photo of hers as well, uh, but I would have taken longer to sort of um, um, bring them all, put them all together. But I'm very sad. Uh, we uh, used to laugh a lot. We celebrated life and relationships. Um, uh, and, and between the two countries, uh, there was a lot of, I mean, he was one of the uh, factors that kept uh, the two, you know, the split family side of India and Pakistan, Bangladesh together. Uh, one of the one of the very fine people uh, who uh, who will be missed, um, and their loss uh, is is sort of uh, uh, irreparable. Uh, uh, so I'm very very uh, sort of sad that I cannot fly his. Funeral is tomorrow. Uh, Nini has uh, written. Meantime, I have gone and checked. Um, so my heartfelt condolences to the family, as I have uh, humbly submitted, but also to his friends, his colleagues, and um, all those who whom he mentored. Uh, so. Um, Chaslav, I'm so glad that we um, um, could get together. Thank you for taking time out even today. And uh, and I, as I said that, you know, when you uh, played your recital, I I would love to record your uh, entire uh, sonata if possible. Maybe we, we'll we'll see. We'll plot it. It'll be it'll be wonderful. And. Uh, it's a pity because many people are saying, oh, can we have some live music? I mean, some, something again. Well, not today. We already had him <laughs> play for you. That was live recording. It was it was just that I have post-produced and played. That's a live session. It was not uh, it is, yeah. artificial <laughs> recording. Uh, what you heard is bingo live uh, without any, that 20-minute sequences without a cut. Um, that's right. I, that's I, right. That's All the, live. The very first one. So that's... Uh, um, it was lovely. And I look forward to our continuing uh, conversation. It's plenty that he is uh, he's doing uh, with me and on his own. So I mean, look forward. Anything, uh, uh, lastly, if you want to respond to some of the comments, Parminder and everybody, thank you so much for, I've already written comments. Uh, I don't want to repeat them for just for the sake of brevity. Uh, but uh, um, uh, Ramanjeet also said that beautiful, the music, the audio, the video quality is awesome, wonderful to work, uh, wonderful work, Amar, and um, to me she is commenting, uh, Cheslov saying gentle and moving uh, piece, you know, she is telling that it was very gentle and very moving, so, um, and Puna Mayu has confirmed that, wow, yes, Ramanjeet is right, the quality is superb. And like never before, both sound and picture. Indeed, you know that's uh, that's uh, absolutely true. And mm -hmm. wanted to give all the credit to Leonardo Amartyan Singh. You know. So I had to. I said, come on, now. that's that's a bit much. <laughs> Don't give him all the credit. <laughs> I, I, I deserve some. <laughs> then he relented. Says, okay, a little bit to you too. <laughs> and uh, Parminder and Mikhail are there. And giving regards and saying wonderful conversation, love the honesty, simplicity, and beautiful thoughts. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ji. That was lovely. And uh, Misha Sharma Badal is saying uh, respects and uh, like that. So, 
Um, it was it was uh, wonderful. Anyway, your you you have the last word. Well, I just wanted to thank you very much, both for the recording. Uh, oh, you may. You know <laughs> that you may. Sorry, that you may. <laughs> Please. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, all the hard work that that that, that you put in. I mean, video editing is you were is uh, I love you. Know, you were horrible. You know, this bugger had his anniversary, and his wife <laughs> ran away with him into a forest. And here I am editing. I said, "Hey, I've just edited this. Can you have a re can you review?" He says, "Oh well, I'll be back into the world in two days." I said, "Come on, you want me to like." <laughs> Hold on. So you, he was like very bad guys. Say some nasty thing about him too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I can't say I apologize for that because it was I, a great I mean, time. I, I, I forgive you. I, I mean, you, you can try your best at apologizing, but I don't need forgiveness. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we had our fifth anniversary with my wife. So we went, we went away. Uh, we have some land over there in Poland and uh, it's really quite nice. There's no electricity and, you know, so you can really <laughs> wild out over there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, spend, you have to spend all your time outside and cook on the fires and these kinds of things. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, but yes, quite bad for video editing. <laughs> Can't do any of that over much. there. I've discovered as much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, no, thank, but thanks for putting the, the work in, and, and uh, I hope it was worth it for you as well. And of it course, was, thank you. Yeah. It was not. <laughs> no, because it's thanks. just a twenty-minute piece. I wish you know. Uh, I mean, we we the idea of the conversation is a conversation. So I'm just joking that I'm alluding to. In fact, I'm sort of uh, uh, coaxing you that you you haven't yet said yes. We'll record the entire Beethoven thing that you're playing. Uh, oh, you, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Now I'm glad. Okay. Now I'm <laughs> sort of, okay. Why don't we, why don't we record the recital? We could also do that. Why not? No. Don't yes. know how yet, but uh, you know, why not? We can give it a try. Yeah, we can. We can. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you have a good Wi-Fi, and we can place uh, a pity that one of the cameras that was like from I please that was my that's almost like a bird's eye view that died you know uh, you know Damien yeah right the one from the front yeah every, every five minutes six minutes it died and of course because the session was on I did not want to text him to put it on because then he, that movement would have been caught so I was like split between that but if we can manage maybe two three uh, you know gadgets that that the way I plant them. Um, uh, let's think about that. I think that'll be fantastic. We could, I could live stream it. We could, we could, as part of your conversation, two or five, uh, we could, we could. That'd be something. Yes. Or we could even record it and then post produce it and then relay it. I mean, I, that would be even better because then you could, rec we can record the, uh, you know, the audio separately and we can have, uh, Leonardo, um, treat that part and, I could edit and that that would be I think that would be fantastic. Let me see if I can come up with something. You know, I'm still new in the city, so I I have to I, I, I can't pull oh. strings like I can in Poland so much. <laughs> photo of uh, Naim and Nini, that's his daughter, uh -huh. Darmine. Uh I really wanted to uh I, I can't really come close because it'll sort of maybe I can just uh, uh zoom in. And then you will see it. Mm. Now you can see because I have to be at a distance. That's a lovely photo, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, it's so sad always to hear about somebody. Yeah, it's, um, he had been ailing for some time and uh, he's a very lovely man. I just dog of a guy. And uh, he'd been to Sultanpur Lodi as well. I mean, um, we had the uh, tribal art, uh, truck art, you know, what they, what Ange does. And uh, so we had an entire exhibition at the Kila Sarai in Sultanpur Lodi um, before insanity uh, struck. The poly I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be spanking some of these politicians. Many careers are going to go. Political careers are going to go next year. So... Oh. Uh, you might uh, not, you guys might not see me uh, in a few weeks or a few months because I'll be 
hyperactive in Punjabi politics for the elections next year. <laughs> oh, so all those cops who have uh, uh, destroyed heritage, who've uh, done uh, you know a war crime um, or crime against humanity as it is, and the politicians who connived and conspired, and those who have sort of uh, been uh, complicit by way of their silence. Oh, Fivel Deep is going to be on the prowl, folks. <laughs> and there'll be no mercy. <laughs> anyway, so uh, talking of name, that they name and Anjum, they, they, uh, and they've all been there. So that was a beautiful photo of Nini and uh, Naeem. Uh, I really wanted to show that on the screen, but it was, uh, I would have had to open up a couple of softwares and I didn't want to, uh, I would have disrupted the live uh, broadcast a bit because they're heavy softwares. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Chesla. My best wishes for the preparations uh, and, and let's plan the recording. I, I love that idea that we can actually just uh, record and it'll be, you know, people will be there. It'll be fantastic. We could, we could do something. Let's, let's plan yes, that. I, I like the idea. <laughs> I yeah, wish I could have... just fly with my field recorders. <laughs> I could get my sound device 7440 in my stereo match pairs, you know. The Schweppes mics and the, um, you know. That'd be so good. I'd have to find another forest to run away from after that <laughs> for two or three days. <laughs> but you would need a piano. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can we can break in into Jihya Sriniak's uh, home. <laughs> we could we could just uh, plot that and we could we could uh, uh, <laughs> record something there. <laughs> Okay, we will. Otherwise, it'll be uh, morning. We should call it a call it a call it Yeah, a thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again for this uh, for the talk for the for the video and thanks to everybody for watching. And you know, we'll 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 be in touch and hope hopefully we can speak soon again. Oh, my brother is also here, so that's lovely. Good to see the son of Professor Darshan Singh uh, Sohal, uh, and uh, so that's some wonderful wonderful people who've been able to join. And uh, love to Ola. Give my compliments for the anniversary. Tell her that, I, that I don't hate her for running away with you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> complying with that kidnapping. Uh, sex <laughs> kidnapping. <laughs> I'm going along with it, yeah. Okay. Bye. All right, then. But take care. Thanks a lot for the best wishes. Bye. Take care. So, dosto, this is my mulaqat today and today's day. I have a lot of time to record this recording and I have a lot of time to record this recording. I have a lot of time to record this recording. I have a lot of time to record this recording. I have a lot of time to record so, a Sangeet de which you know, kya ye duki la chaka hai, aur kala de which composer baat ala hai, aur menu aas hai, isi jadi ida jada chintan si, socho fikar si, better bande jadi composition de utte aur vaise hi bajane baabat, wo bahut hi maina rakhda hai. Menu aas hai jadi sikharti hangi aur jadi um kalam tari ne jehde likhde ne sangeet te ohna sareyan vaste vaartha jehdi hai gi hai oh bahut maayna rakhi gi maaya to apne izazat lena cheti ch jaldi milange is aitwar pandit somdad pattu hona de naal 10 tarikh nu meri jehdi vaartha agge chal rahi hai oh jari rahegi te main aas karda tusi sare sama kadoge ho sakda hai us to ek do din pehla hor baith ka vi hon um ਤੇ ਉਹ ਲੋਕ ਫਿਰ ਮੁਲਾਕਾਤ ਕਰਾਂ ਦਾ ਤੱਕ ਲਈ ਧਿਆਨ ਰੱਖੋ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਵਰਤੋ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖ ਰਿਹਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਜਣੇ ਸ਼ੇਕੀਆਂ ਭੋਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕੋਵਿਡ ਦੇ ਮਾਮਲੇ ਚ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਡੈਲਟਾ ਵਰਸ਼ਨ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਚ ਤੇ ਫੰਗਸ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸ਼ੇਕੀ ਨਾ ਕੋ ਮਾਰੇ ਔਰ ਧਿਆਨ ਰੱਖੋ ਛੇਤੀ ਮਿਲਾਂਗੇ ਸੁਖੀ ਰਹੋ ਖੁਸ਼ ਰਹੋ आवाज रहो थे खुदा हाफिज नमस्कार वेरी गुड नाइट सतकर्ता वायुजिका खालसा
வாஞ்சிக்கப்படுறேன்